This is another lecture of international trade. We are now in the sixth week and we will uh, <clears throat> continue to discuss trade policy under imperfect competition. As you might recall uh, in the last lecture, we have seen uh, the impact of tariffs, uh, subsidies and taxes in the framework of imperfect competition. And now we will move on to quantitative restrictions under imperfect competition. We have monopoly, we have oligopoly, we have uh, all those market structures that differ substantially from perfect competition. We have issues like market power, and we have price discrimination, price dif differentiation. Those are the issues we are dealing with in detail. <clears throat> and we, of course, continue to have product variety as an important um, feature of imperfect competition. After taking a look at quantitative restrictions, we'll move on to dumping and anti-dumping legislation, a very important issue nowadays. Uh, after, after that, we will summarize what we have seen, referring to imperfect competition, and draw some conclusions and take a look at the scope of further research in this area. Finally, we will uh, start to discuss the next topic, multinational enterprises. Well, just as under perfect competition, imperfect competition raises very important questions related to the effects of trade and trade policy on income and income distribution. We have seen that trade and income distribution uh, and the income of uh, in individual production factors like labor and capital are very important when we discuss trade. The distribution of gains and losses from trade among consumers, producers and the government differs particularly strongly um, under imperfect competition from uh, the one that we have already discussed under perfect competition. And of course, the introduction of multinational production again uh, uh, brings us a different dis distribution of gains and losses because we have uh, ownership uh, <clears throat> that is scattered. Yes, we have foreign ownership. We have uh, uh, multinational enterprises that are active in, in several countries. Yes, we have uh, supply chains. We have trade within a multinational enterprise. We have trade uh, between multinational enterprises. Uh, so we have a number of, of issues that uh, are the uh, main features of modern uh, international trade and that also have a bearing on the distribution of income. Well, <clears throat> starting with, with an import quota, we just assume a single domestic firm producing this good and a fringe of foreign exporters serving uh, the home market. Um, the discussion will uh, include a tariff in the sense that we will, we will compare, yes, what is the impact of a of an import quota as compared with the tariff. So if we just uh, introduce a tariff and import quota that allow the same volume of imports, yes, um, 
they do not affect welfare equally. Yes, so tariff and import quota is not the same under a perfect competition. If you take a look at the figure 10.8 on page 330 of the prescribed reading, which is chapter 10 of the book Applied International Trade, you will see that the figure 10.8 displays demand in the importing country at the marginal cost of the single domestic producer. Foreign supply is assumed to be infinitely elastic, so horizontal, yes, at the world price P star. If we impose a net valorem tariff uh, tau, and this tariff increases the home price from P star to P star multiplied by brackets 1 plus tau, and shifts home production up words from Q1 to Q2. The home firm uh, faces the kinked demand curve V and D, which is infinitely elastic at the price P star multiplied by 1 plus tau. If we replace the tariff by a quarter, the local firm faces demand at prices lower than P star. At higher prices, the firm faces the demand curve DSTZ, which is horizontal only between the points S and T, equal to market demand less the import quota. The corresponding marginal revenue crosses the marginal cost at point J, which shows that the profit maximizing quantity produced by the local firm is reduced by the quarter to Q3. So again, if we introduce a tariff, um, whole production increases from Q1 to Q3. If we introduce uh, a quota, then the production of the home firm is reduced to Q3 and substituted by imports. A quota that allows for imports in excess of free trade imports also pushes the price P star upwards since foreign supply is sold at a price higher than P star uh, multiplied 1 plus tau. In spite of this welfare of the home country, results to be lower under a quota than under a tariff. Importers earn a rent that could be absorbed by the government if it would sell import licenses. So by introducing a quota, the home country loses welfare amounting to the area JRM. So we can see here what happens and we also have the uh, issue of import licenses. Yes, so when you introduce an import quota, you have to determine who will be able to take advantage of this import quota. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, uh, uh, in the home country, the imports have to be sold by someone. And in the foreign country, uh, uh, this, these goods have to have to be exported. Yeah, so we have a benefit for the foreign exporter, and we have a benefit for the, the home country importer. And uh, the government could also participate if it would distribute these imports among uh, home country importers uh, through a license system. This, of course, has a problem that it is subject to corruption in many countries. So firms lobby and fight in order to get access to these licenses. <clears throat> now assume that <clears throat> we have the case of an important country served by a fringe of competitive domestic producers and also by a single dominant foreign firm. 
You can see this uh, in figure 10.9 on page 331 of the prescribed reading. This foreign film produces at marginal cost MC star and faces residual demand D. Imports are subject to a tariff which lowers the demand faced by the foreign firm to D tau at the quantity Q tau. Home consumers pay the higher price P hat tau and the foreign supplier receives the price P tau per unit of the good. When this tariff is replaced by a quota at the import quantity Q tau, the foreign firm faces the king demand curve above ABQ. The difference between the tariff and the quota in this case is that under the quota, the foreign supplier sells at the higher price, P hat tau, which is the price the consumers pay under the tariff. Now, in comparing quotas and tariffs, it is useful to note that quotas tend to support monopoly power more than tariffs do. This is the case, for example, when domestic monopolistic firms are protected by tariffs. They know that they can only raise the prices up to a certain level and that if they exceed that level, imports will compete and the price will fall. A quota, however, limits the imports, provides absolute protection to domestic monopolistic firms, well, because imports will be limited to the quota. Quotas restrict imports, but also give the foreign producer an incentive to upgrade its products. The upgrading happens through two channels, either via a change in the composition of the products in the quota-restricted category, or via a change in the quality of the products within the restricted category. In the case in which the composition changes, the quota shifts consumer demand away from lower quality towards higher quality products that sell at a higher price. And this occurs because the quota raises the cost of each variety by an amount equal to the quota rent. Since the price of the lower quantity variety increases, the relative price of the higher quality products falls and demand is uh, tilted towards higher quality varieties. So we see that there is a relationship in, in some cases between quotas and quality. Let us now discuss the issue of dumping. What is dumping? Well, firms active in many markets yes, may choose a strategy of price discrimination. This means selling the same good in different markets at different prices. Beginning with the exporter that serves the home and one foreign market. So, you have an exporter that, that was also a producer and serves the home market and the foreign market. It is normal to see that uh, the product is sold cheaper uh, on the home market than on the foreign market because in the foreign market you have additional costs. You have trade costs, transport, insurance, and all that. But the basic idea of dumping is that a firm sells a good cheaper in a foreign country than at home for specific reasons. The firm may price its good below either average or marginal costs. Pricing below average costs but above marginal costs 
is a common short-run response to a depressed market, depressed demand, either in the home market or in the foreign market. This response helps the firm maintain its market share and, strictly speaking, does not constitute dumping in the strict sense. Pricing below marginal costs. Well, firms aiming at creating or exploiting market power, here, here we go, may choose to set prices below mar marginal costs. An example is the predation predation strategy. A firm, the predator, engages in conduct harmful to itself for no other reason than to injure a competitor. The goal is to induce the prey to leave the market or at least to reduce its market share substantially. The predator, however, has to be in a position to incur losses for a longer time than the prey. So this is a, a, a war between uh, two or more firms, yes, where one firm is very aggressive and reduces its uh, price below marginal cost, hoping that it will uh, push other firms out of business soon. And then <clears throat> this uh, predator can expand its own market share at the expense of the others. Another uh, uh, interesting case of dumping happens uh, because of fluctuating exchange rates. Yes, so there is no real intention on the side of firms to sell cheaper in a foreign market than they do in the home market. But if exchange rates uh, you know, fluctuate, then uh, this could lead to a situation in which dumping uh, could be detected by one of the governments, although there is no intention on the side of the firms to do so. But many countries have introduced anti-dumping legislation. One of the motivations for this is the global reduction of tariffs over the past decades in the wake of several rounds of trade negotiations with the GATT and the WTO. Another motivation is the protection against anti-dumping measures in other countries. So you, you int introduce them just as a deterrent for governments in other countries. Some instances, the initiation of anti-dumping proceedings may be a first step towards collusive arrangements between local firms and exporters. <clears throat> so in practice, a substantial share of anti-dumping cases are resolved with negotiated agreements between local and foreign firms, with the agreements including settlements under which both groups of firms earn profits unattainable in a non-cooperative uh, trade environment. So once of course, the firms agree to such, a, such an arrangement, the anti-dumping proceedings are stopped. Yes, so here we see collusive behavior uh, of domestic and foreign firms. Yes, they just sit at a table and negotiate the best outcome for both groups um, in order to oblige the foreign firms to sit at the table to negotiate, uh, you ask your own government to uh, initiate anti-dumping anti -dumping proceedings. But as you can see in this, in this case, those proceedings are only uh, pressure on foreign firms to negotiate. And once they have reached a good agreement, uh, these proceedings are uh, stopped. Well, in the framework of dumping and anti-dumping legislation, we have three different outcomes. 
in addition to the cases that uh, I have just mentioned. Anti-dumping can reduce the volume of imports from countries whose firms have been found to engage in injurious dumping. Yes, So you just uh, stop trading with uh, countries that host firms uh, that like to engage in dumping. This is called trade destruction. Anti-dumping measures may also induce additional imports from countries whose firms have not been found to engage in dumping. So if you just switch uh, to, to other countries, yes, where firms do not engage in dumping, then you are diverting trade, yes, called the trade diversion. And the third case would be anti-dumping measures in an importing country that may encourage the exporting country suspected of engaging in dumping to redirect exports towards third countries to compensate for lost sales in the country where anti-dumping measures are in place. So this is called trade deflection. So we have to take a look at the behavior of firms and governments in this case. And we have the possibility of trade destruction, trade diversion, and trade deflection, in addition to the strategies that we have already mentioned. Well, let me now conclude trade policy under imperfect competition. Um, <clears throat> in reading these slides, and the prescribed uh, chapter uh, of the book Applied International Trade, you will find that in some cases under imperfect competition, we just pay yes, for firms and for countries in terms of welfare uh, to introduce uh, trade policy instruments and to try to influence the distribution of income between national and foreign firms and governments. In spite of that, the majority consensus emerging from the literature is that the case for government interventionism is hardly strengthened. So while the existence of welfare improving policy uh, prescriptions is a necessary condition to recommend a deviation from foreign trade is not a sufficient condition. Remember, necessary and sufficient are two conditions that we should satisfy. The range of models that we use in international trade theory to discuss trade policy and imperfect competition assume that government has all the information necessary to justify the measures. In practice, though, this is generally not the case. And if a government is somehow able to resolve the information problem, its trade policies may still fail to produce the intended effect if trading partners if all trading partners use the same policy instruments. Because then your trading partners, other countries can immediately respond. And this takes power from your own instruments. Political economy considerations also weigh heavily against interventionism. Lobbying and corruption both entail a resource cost that ought to be set against the potential gains of interventionism. Trade policy, as you know, always <clears throat> results from the political process, yes, in parliaments or, or in the policy process, in which small groups of lobbyists can be very successful in imposing their interests. So the impact of <clears throat> trade policies on welfare and income distribution is also influenced by ownership issues, as I mentioned before. 
So if foreign firms are active in the home country, a share of welfare in the home country also accrues to foreigners. So uh, when you estimate the welfare effects of trade policy measures um, in an open economy with foreign firms active in the domestic market, you don't know exactly how much of this welfare uh, <clears throat> accrues to the home country and how much to the foreign country. We have seen a number of models in this discussion where um, we use home and foreign firms uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a very simple context. In, in, in the real world, of course, uh, things are quite more complex. Total or partial ownership of firms located in one country by residents of other countries tend to complicate the welfare effects of trade policy. So at, you, at the end of the day, you don't know exactly who is going to really profit from uh, these trade policies. Foreign share holding raises the possibility that firms located in different countries operate under common management in the case of multinational enterprises. And for that reason alone, they respond differently to policy interventions and independent firms that are not linked to a multinational enterprise. So let's now turn to multinational production. What are multinational enterprises? Well, these are firms that own and manage establishments in more than one country. The controlling union is the patent the controlled unit, the affiliate or subsidiary. Horizontal multinationals are firms that produce the same product in different countries. Vertical multinationals are firms that produce intermediate products in one country, ship them to their affiliates located in other countries for further processing. And of course, the very common case is a mixed one where firms produce both final products and intermediate products resulting to an internal international uh, supply chain. If we take a look at statistics, you can see uh, take, uh, having a look at the handbook of statistics published by the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development in Geneva, um, <clears throat> that the foreign direct investment inflows and outflows for the year 2019 inflows amount in the world as a whole to 1,540 billion US dollars and outflows amount to 1,314. So as you see, outflows and inflows differ. This, of course, is a statistical issue. Uh, normally, they should be the same on a world scale. This table shows us where capital comes from. Which are the countries, which are the major exporters of capital outflows, and which are the major importers of capital inflows? If you take a look at developing countries, developing countries have been the origin of 373 billion US dollars as outflows. And they have been the target of 685 billion US dollars as inflows. So you can see that inflows are much higher than outflows. And if you take a look at developed countries, 
Here you see that's the other way around. Outflows are higher than inflows. Interestingly, most of the outflows from developed countries, they end up also in developed countries. And only a small difference ends up in developing countries. Among developing countries, we have in these statistics here, Africa, America, Asia, and Oceania. And you can see that Asia plays a very important role. So almost all outflows from developing countries originate in Asia. Yes, and a large part of inflows, of course, also pertains to Asia. In America, in Latin America, you have a much lower volume of outflows, as you also have in Africa, <clears throat> and you have a higher, much higher volume of inflows. Same happens to Africa. So this is the distribution of capital in the world in the year 2019. Of course, outflows and inflows change every year. And uh, during the pandemic, of course, uh, outflows were much lower. So inflows also were much lower. How can firms become multinational? Generally by merging or by acquiring an existing, uh, merging with or acquiring an existing foreign firm, or by establishing an entirely new firm in a foreign country. So if a South African company buys a company in Mozambique or in Botswana, yes, so this is a way to establish a multinational firm. Or if a South African company just creates a new firm in Nigeria, yes, then it goes multi multinational. What happens with, with the capital? How do you finance that investment? Well, the capital may originate in the country of the parent company. It may originate in the country of the affiliate, where you create the affiliate, or of course in a third country. For example, you could borrow money in, uh, in the Gulf countries, yes, and then invest in Botswana or in Nigeria. <coughs> What is the, the actual definition of foreign direct investment? Well, when the firm exercises control over the foreign establishment in which it acquires an ownership share. So it's not necessary for the share to be 100%, but it's necessary for the control to be there. Now we can also ask why does a firm establish a foreign subsidiary when a firm also has other alternatives to supply foreign markets? For example, by exporting or by licensing a foreign firm <clears throat> or by creating a joint venture. Well, <clears throat> there are three main reasons why multinational enterprises emerge and don't decide or decide not to export, not to license. Those three necessary conditions can be summarized in the word OLI denoting ownership of knowledge, locational advantage, and internalization advantage. Ownership of knowledge means that if a country, perform, if a firm in, in the home country performs very well, yes, it means that it performs better than competitors. 
And generally, this better performance is also based on uh, improved knowledge, either on how to produce a good or a knowledge uh, referring to the final product. Yes. So you, you have done some research and development, you have adjusted the product, or you have done research and development and you have adjusted the production process. So in some, in some way you are superior to your competitors. Maybe you have better marketing instruments, can also be. Another um, source of advantage may be a location map. So why do uh, country and firms from Australia or from the US or from other countries uh, come to Africa, or from China, come to Africa uh, to uh, engage in mining. Well, because the mines are here, yes, the mines are in, are in Africa, and the firms are interested in, in metals and in other natural resources, and so the location is important, and so you have to go there. Internalization. What is that? Well, you have learned in, in basic microeconomics what an externality is and that externalities should be internalized, right? So, for example, if I smoke, if I smoke uh, in my room and there are no other people there, then it's my, it's my problem, yes? Um, if... Uh, the smoke is good or bad for my health. But at the moment in which I'm sharing a room with other people and the only one who smokes is myself, then I'm just imposing the smoke on other people without carrying the cost myself. So this smoking is uh, an activity with an externality. And so the best thing is that I take my cigarette and go outside the office, yes, and smoke outside where I don't have to impose smoke on my colleagues, right? So I, I, by going outside, I just internalize the cost of smoking. Generally, when you buy <coughs> cigarettes, you don't pay for cleaning the air, yes, if you would then you would buy an air conditioning uh, uh, or <clears throat> some other machine, yes, to help you clean the air immediately after you have uh, started to smoke. By doing that, yes, you could also internalize the uh, uh, impact of smoking. So, now, transferred to multinational enterprise, what does internalization mean? If you rely on foreign firms to produce and to sell your product in a foreign country, then you're giving away the knowledge how to produce this good. You're giving away your knowledge of how to sell the good. Yeah. So, uh, sometimes it's better to do it yourself instead of giving this knowledge away, right? So this is called internalization advantage. Okay, so these are the three uh, sources of advantage that we will uh, see in the next lecture in detail. Thank you very much for your attention right now.